given for you. This is the cup that holds the blood of a new covenant. This is forgiveness, simple and true. This is the way that I have made for you. Before you This is the way I have made for you, the song says. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we remember about 3,500 years ago when Moses brought God's people out of slavery, out of Egypt. He went to the Pharaoh on the 10th and final plague of death and said, let my people go, because death had passed over God's people. And the Pharaoh said, 10 plagues, that's enough, go. And they moved out of Egypt, <clears throat> the land of Goshen, part of the Red Sea. Many of us are familiar with that part of the Bible story of Moses. He got the 10 commandments, Moses did. And on the first year anniversary, they had the feast of Passover. That is, death passed over God's people. And for 1,500 years, they celebrated the feast of Passover. Up until the time, through the time of Jesus. Jesus was, a, one of the things that he was, was a rabbi. 
and he was gathered with his disciples. A disciple is a follower of Jesus, just like we are here this morning. Jesus was gathered with his disciples, celebrating the feast of Passover the night before he went to the cross. It was that night that he took the bread. He gave thanks and praise to his Father in heaven and said, said to his disciples, this bread is my body that I give to you. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And I would like for us to remember what exactly his body represents. In the book of Isaiah 53, it says that he was bruised for our iniquities pierced for our transgressions, and by his stripes we are healed. Amen. What's the difference between a, an iniquity and a transgression? An iniquity is an inside sin. Uh, it, it, it could be greed. It could be lust. Uh, and a transgression is an outside sin. It, it, it's actually robbing somebody. The difference between an iniquity and transgression is like the difference between lust and adultery. Iniquity is it's uh, an inside bent that we have. A transgression is it acting it out. So when the Bible says he was bruised, what's a bruise? It's an inside injury. It doesn't break the skin. All black and blue. He was bruised for our inside iniquity sins. He was pierced with the cat of nine tails outside his body. He bled for our outside sin. It's a beautiful picture. He was whipped with stripes. By his stripes we're healed. So as we remember here today, I think of being bruised for our iniquities, pierced for our transgressions. By his stripes we're healed, all in the bread. As he said, this is my body given for each one of you. Whenever you take the bread, do this in memory of me. And the followers of Jesus took the bread. In the same way, Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave thanks and praise to his Father in heaven and said to his disciples, This cup is a new covenant in my blood that I give to every single one of you. Whenever you take the cup, do this in memory of me. And the followers of Jesus took the cup. Lord God, I ask you that through the bread and the juice representing your body and blood, that it would do everything possible in our bodies to come in a closer communion with you. May we be transformed and molded and shaped more into your likeness, more into a oneness with you for having coming into a closer communion with you through the elements of Holy Communion. Oh God, come and be in our lives in a greater way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh, oh. Good morning. My name is Pastor Blaine. I have been here before. I appreciate being invited back. Um, I am a 
on staff pastor at Muldoon Community Assembly, uh, my senior pastor, Kent Redfern and Alan, Pastor Alan Humphreys have been buddies for a lot of years. That's kind of how I got to know Pastor Alan. And uh, um, I'm on staff there at Muldoon Community Assembly. I lead the Celebrate Recovery group with my wife Robin here. And uh, uh, I'll tell you, this song, I'm, I Am Redeemed. By the blood of the Lamb, the word of my testimony, I am an overcomer, and I sense that in many of um, your all testimonies um, this morning. You've been singing and it for six years. I think that's fantastic. It's nonstop. Every yeah. Sunday. Every Sunday. It's our song. Yes. It's our closing song. <clears throat> my song is a lot of people's your song. Uh, about, um, uh, about two weeks ago, I sent that song to the worship director at the Celebrate Recovery that we lead every two, my wife and I lead every Tuesday night. And I said, this is a song that fits us um, because my senior pastor, Kent Redfern, um, his dad was a, was a preacher. So Kent is a PK preacher's kid, uh, lived a pretty straight and narrow life most of his life. Um, I know he's human being, and I know that he's got issues. I am not that guy. I am. I am the guy that I had issues when, when when I was a kid. I had some. I was a high school dropout. I I left the lower 48, came to Alaska. I was like the prodigal son, not just spiritually, but physically, leaving the lower 48 to Alaska. Um, when, when my life got really, really crummy, I, I drank a lot of alcohol, played around with drugs recreationally. Um, I, I've been arrested, thrown in jail. You'd think you'd learn after one time. Three times I've been arrested. And, and of course, that was years ago. Um, but I get, I get the song, I am redeemed. And, and it's a beautiful picture when he can take the brokenness of a human being and, and transform us and mold us and shape us more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. It's, it's beautiful. It's fantastic. It is by his grace we're saved. And, and we know this. We, uh, the, the, what's the verse? Uh, Ephesians 2.8. For grace you have been saved, not by works, lest any man should boast. If we could earn it, if it's something that we could work for, we could say, look at me. Look how much I worked for. No, it doesn't work that way. It's by grace you're saved, not by works. In fact, that happens to be the name of my message. Grace, not performance. None of us come to faith in Christ and say, Look how well I'm doing. Most of us, a lot of us, come to faith in Christ because we're broken. We're not performing well. We're, we, we, I, I remember one of my Bible school um, instructors, he said, there's two kinds of prayers when you cry out to God. One is, oh God, I need you. Then there's the prayer, oh God, I need you. That was me. I was raised Catholic, and I'm, I'm going to get to that in my story here a little bit, but uh, uh, there kind of comes a point in many of our lives where it's, I'm at the end of my rope. I am broken. I need you, Lord. I can't perform. I, I'm, I'm broken, and I need the Lord. And we come to faith in Christ, and we accept our salvation through grace. What is grace? Unmerited favor. That's the Christianese answer. Un, Non-merit. What is merit? If you have an Eagle Scout and he does this task, this, this thing, he gets a merit badge. All right? He's rewarded for merit, for something, do, doing something. For deeds. Exactly right. This is an interactive sermon. I love it. This is great. It's deeds. Salvation is not like that. It's a non, grace is non-deed, non-merited, unmerited favor is grace. 
So we come to faith in Christ, and and we experience this. It's unconditional love. Unconditional love oftentimes is what parents have for their kids. I'm always amazed at, at uh, when a child goes awry, kind of like Pastor Blaine did for a while before I was a pastor. And, and my mom loved me even when I was trouble. A parent's love for a child is unconditional. I'll see sometimes on, on the news where they'll interview the parent of a, of a murderer and they'll say, well, he's my kid, I will love them. No matter what way they've done, no matter what a child does, the parent loves the child. There might be a parent right here today that has a wayward child and says, I know my child is wayward. I know that my child has done something wrong, but yet I love him unconditionally. My child does not have to perform to earn my love. Sometimes we kind of bring that in inadvertently. If you clean your room, you'll get a cookie. All right? If you do this deed, you will receive mommy's love. Or Johnny, if you mow the grass, then I'll take you fishing. And I understand there's reward for good behavior. I, I get that. But sometimes we instill that to, to experience love from mom and dad, you do this task to earn love. God's not like that. We, there's nothing, nothing that we can do to earn God's love in a bigger dimension. In fact, the Bible says the opposite. Um, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. You know John 3, 16. It, he came for the sinner. He didn't come for the Pharisees. He didn't come for the religious people. He didn't come for the keep, keepers of the law. In fact, he called them white necked sepulchers, a brood of vipers in another place he called them. The religious people is not who he came from. He came for the broken people. He came for the people that said, oh God, I need you. That's me. That's some of you. I can tell by your response. That's some of you. In jail. In jail. Yes. And and so we come to faith in Christ, we have no performance to show, but then we kind of get on performance mode. And we kind of say, look what I'm doing. Some of us, I hope we don't. I was there for a little while. It was probably longer than I should have been. God loves us with unmerited favor by grace. And there's a difference between love and being saved. God, God loved us and provided the option for salvation. When we exercise that option and say, the rest that I am, I attribute my sin to him on the cross, that's when the salvation happens. When we come to a place and say, it is not my performance that I'm accepted and loved in the kingdom of God, and we acknowledge our weakness and say, you're strong, God, I am weak, it's all you, it's not me, it's not what I, I remember several years ago, there was a gal in, in our home church at MCA church, um, that, that she got cancer, and she says, I don't understand why I got cancer after all the things that I've done for the church. My husband and I, we go to the old folks' home once a week and play. We play music on, on this worship night. We visit these folks. I, I like to do all these things for God, and I still got cancer. I don't understand it. She said that on stage, on a microphone. It was her theological position. Well, that's works. That's earning favor by good deeds and actions. Now, good deeds and actions are, are, are wonderful as long as they're prompted from the position of, oh God, look at what you have done. I am amazed what you do in my life. How can I give back and, and show my gratitude? <laughs> Different than earning our favor by performance. When we're weak, that's oftentimes when God is strong in our lives. In fact, the Apostle Paul had a thorn in his side that, that was there for all of his life. 
Um, in fact, we can read about that in 2 Corinthians 12. We'll pick it up in 7. Therefore, this is Paul writing in the, in the Bible. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I have been given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to tor torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest upon me. Paul goes on to say, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. Christianity is quite a paradox, isn't it? A ton of paradoxical things are, say in scripture. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. When I am weak, then I am strong. Sometimes it's a little confusing, especially for the person that, that is trying to figure it out from the beginning. What does it look like to say, when I'm weak, then I'm strong? Me, personally, when I was a, a, a teen, well, actually a preteen, when I was a kid, eight, nine, ten years old, I was Catholic, and I would go to the church, and I would sing, because I like to sing. Most of us do, even those that can't sing very well like to sing out called a joyful noise, sons of the Lord. The Lord likes the way the raven sounds, so he likes the way I sound. Amen. My brother and sister, they would tease me about, Blaine sings out. No, oh, yeah, he really sings loud. I thought it was a compliment. I thought that they were kind of jealous. As it turns out, I'm not a very good singer. I remember when I was... Uh, in, in, in early teens, in the 70s, I was in the back of the church, of a, a neighboring church, uh, another Catholic church, and the choir director came up to me and says, uh, young man, you should be in our choir. I said, me? By that time, I had kind of learned that having a golden throat, a singing voice was not me. So he said, young man, you should be in our choir. I said, me? Why me? He said, I saw you in the back singing out. To which I thought, you saw me, you didn't hear me. <laughs> True story. I, that, that, then in the 80s, by that time, I, I moved to Alaska. I wanted to sing. I, I wanted, wanted it badly. I found a voice coach. Uh, in fact, the, Lois Shaparo, I remember her well. And, and she was a voice coach for opera singers and people that perform at the, at the Performing Arts Center in Anchorage. And, and I would go to her once a week. It was 50 bucks uh, a, a week. And I, we would get the little cassette and she would take, uh, send it home with me and I would have my homework. And uh, I went to her like for a year. That's a couple thousand dollars. I really wanted to learn to sing. I remember one time she was, um, she had the grand piano, put me in the alcove of the, the grand piano with the music stand. And of course I can't read music. And she'd say, just, just follow along on the music. And so I'd look down and I kind of am smart enough to know that when they go up, uh, I go up and when the notes go down, I go down, but F or G sharp or C flat or I, I don't know what any of that is. But, um, I tried. I tried so hard. I wanted to learn to sing. I gave up. That that day. I remember that was in the, in the 80s. In the 90s, I uh, I went to a convention, a, a seminar down in Reno, a week long seminar. They had four voice coaches there, and and there was I don't know about 20 of us taking this this seminar, and there was uh, they had taught me this and, 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 and the, these techniques and Blaine, you can do this. And, and at one point they had me lay on my back with my feet up against the wall, with my tush up against the, the, the wall. And, and one coach was, was pushing on my stomach. The other one was pushing on my, my uh, 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 chest. And the other one was saying, now breathe this. And the other one was saying, they were trying to get me to work the diaphragm in such a way. And, uh, it didn't work. I, I was paying for it, yes. 
I wanted to learn to say, I can remember when I, uh, uh, in, in, after the turn of the century, probably in the early 2000s, um, by this time, I know singing is not my gift. I, I when people are, are, are on a microphone and, and I'm a pastor and I, I, I don't join in, and, um, but I, there was this one time I was leading a Sunday night service at MCA Church and, and I was a fresh, somewhat new lead. And, uh, and it was kind of that sing-songy. There was no song, but it was kind of freestyle worship. And I thought, well, this isn't really a song. I can help it along. So I was on the mic and I said, yes, Lord, we worship you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And um, later that night, Pastor Kent Redfern, I love him dearly, but he said, Blaine, you know, singing, it's not your gift. <laughs> That's true. I know it's not. And I have prayed, I've prayed, I've prayed. Um, Lord, I want to sing. I want to, I want to, I could be a better preacher if in the middle of my preaching I could break off into song and, and, and illustrate my point with this great song. It hasn't happened yet. Or, 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 or walk up on the platform when the band is singing and join in the last song and be preacher Blaine that has a melodic, mel, uh, melodious so, song and, and I, it ain't there. It's just not there. It's not my gift. What is my gift? One of the things that I love to do, I love end-of-life ministry. It, 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 it energizes me. It, 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 to be close to somebody when they're getting ready to go to heaven, when they're days away, hours away, of graduating this race here on earth and meeting the Lord Jesus Christ, I've had some amazing, incredible spiritual experiences, deathbed, experiences when when somebody's just ready to go to heaven it's beautiful and i i recognize it's not for everybody it is an area that god has gifted me i love it sometimes sometimes when it the moment is right i will take the person's hand and i'll pray this one time i, I prayed for a lady and they said she's brain dead so they're just keeping her alive on the she's intubated and on the ventilator and and just until all the family gets there and i hold her hand and i pray with her and i pray lord god um, bless her family and her children by name and she starts crying and i'm thinking this woman is not brain dead she may be kept alive on the ventilator but she can hear she knows what's going on and i've had a, a, lots of those kind of experiences. Sometimes I'll take somebody by the hand and I'll think, it's time for a song. And I'll hold somebody's hand when they're hours away from leaving earth, going to heaven and say, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Or I'll sing, Jesus loves the little children. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. God's in it. Am I a singer? No. Not even a little bit. I've tried. Spent thousands of dollars. But at that moment, when I am weak, he is strong. It's fantastic. I love it. God flows through us not based on our performance, by his grace. Flows through every one of us. Each one of us is differently abled, differently gifted. And when we find that flow of how we can navigate our lives to best serve the kingdom of God, it's beautiful. Even in your weakness. It's not based on performance. It's based on the love of the Lord Jesus Christ flowing in each one of us. What's the deepest desire of your heart? <laughs> I remember the first time 
the guy asked me that. I thought, I don't know, maybe double cheeseburger, I don't know. <laughs> Deepest desire of your heart is to love, to love well, to be loved and to give love. A four-year-old knows that, that's why he wants a puppy. He wants to love. If love is the deepest desire of your heart, and it is, what is your biggest fear? Your biggest, not be loved, rejection. Absolutely. Every one of us has a fear of rejection. And I believe it, we're not rejected by God. God sent his son yet while we're sinners. We're deeply loved by God. We're not rejected by, but we're afraid of being rejected from others. And I believe that the devil uses that as a hook to get us to performance mode. Blaine, you would be loved better by God if you were to sing better. No, 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 no. That's a lie from the pit of hell. There is nothing I can do to get love, to be loved better. But my fear of rejection will oftentimes motivate me to do things that I shouldn't. Or, 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 or keep me trapped, let's say it that way. And I believe that that happens to a lot of us. <laughs> you know, I already said I lead the Celebrate Recovery at, with Robin. Um, we have a whole team, actually, at MCA Church. A couple of months ago, one of the guys says, Pastor Blaine, I've been, been clean and sober now for like for four months and, and uh, great, fantastic. He said, but some of my buddies have called me up that I used to go drinking with. And when I said, no, I'm sober, I, I don't want to drink anymore. They said, well, we don't want to have anything to do with you. And he told me, he said, it felt like a knife was stabbed in my heart. I, because you're living a better life, now you feel like you're, you're, you're being stabbed in the heart. Why? Because you felt rejection. No, it, it's... On one hand, you can say you can be an inspiration to those people that need to be inspired. That's great. But the fear of rejection is a huge, huge motivator. The fear of man is a control issue that the devil uses. God's not like that. God loves us with the way we are. He made us the way we are. God loves us not through performance mode. He loves us when we're weak. When we're weak, he can be strong in our lives. There's different kinds of weaknesses. In fact, I've identified four different types this morning. The first type of weakness that I've identified is our inability. It's something that we just haven't learned yet. We could be young or it's a new task or something we, we just don't know about. Uh, clearly, I have an inability to sing. Um, or, or oftentimes we have an inability because we haven't learned something yet. Uh, and oftentimes that goes away as we learn the ability. Then there is iniquities. We have within us a bent towards sin. Uh, an iniquity can be a weakness. We already talked about that uh, he was bruised for our iniquities. This ties into the communion that we, we just had. An iniquity is... Um, uh, could be a sexual desire, uh, could be anger, legalism, negativity. Have you ever known that person that, that is negative about everything? And um, in fact, I, I, I used to know years ago, I knew somebody and I thought um, if somebody came up to her and says, congratulations, you won a million dollars. Her response would have been, oh, now I just got to pay more taxes. I mean, negative about everything. I, I'll pay the taxes, ah. <laughs> or forgiveness, that can be, uh, unforgiveness, that can be an iniquity, or greed, or selfishness. Oftentimes we learn these iniquities, uh, the, the, they're generational, we learn them from our parents, and uh, 
Grandpa was selfish, dad was selfish, and that's where I learned to be selfish too. If we have an iniquity in our lives, that can be broken by the blood of Jesus. Surrendered it unto the Lord, and that weakness may still be with you for a while, but the sin part is gone as we uh, surrender it unto the Lord. So we have an four types of weaknesses, inability, inequity, and then infirmity. Uh, that's in our physical body. Job, of course, many of us know the story of Job that uh, he, he was struck uh, in his body by the evil one. God allowed that. Um, he recovered. So sometimes an infirmity, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes an infirmity is temporary. The Apostle Paul, as we read in 2 Corinthians, his infirmity, thorn in the flesh, was permanent. He had it all the way until he died. I don't know whether I'll ever be blessed with a melodic voice to sing or not. Is it an infirmity? I don't know. You decide, but don't decide based on how I sing. I don't know. <laughs> and then, then the fourth weakness that we have is an inherent weakness. It's the way we're born. God could have made us perfect to follow him exactly. It's such and such time I devote my time robotically to the Lord. No, I didn't do that. He made us with a free will. He made us independent. He made us in his image that is relational. What's the deepest desire of your heart? To be loved. That's how we're made in the image of love, to want to give love and to receive love. However, we're not robotic. We have, we have a free will. We can pick and choose if we want to be in the right relationship with the Lord or not. He woos us. He wants us. And oftentimes there's circumstances that come into our lives where we cry out to him and say, oh, I need you now. But a weakness oftentimes is something that we're born with. We're, uh, Moses wasn't a good speaker. He led the people out of Israel. And each one of us has weaknesses that, that we wish we didn't have. Or, well, most of us have weaknesses uh, that, that we're born with. And we're, we're sheep. We need a shepherd. That's the way we're made. And there is nothing, nothing wrong with that. It is in our weaknesses that we're made strong. It is in that time where we say, cry out to the Lord, I need you. All, I can't perform. And, and God didn't, doesn't want us to be in relationship with him on performance mode. It is by grace you're saved, not by works. It is by grace you're loved, not by merits and deeds. And in that, when we come to him and offer unto him all that we have, all that we are, which came from him in the first place, he, he, he dwells in that. He, he's, he, can, he connects with us. He partners with us. And with every person here, every person here, um, the, the Bible says in Romans 12, just as each of us has one body with many members, and all the members have different function. So it is, we who are in Christ form one body and each member belongs to all the others. Each one of us is different. And we bring together a body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, when we come together and bring our different giftings, our different abilities together to move the advancement of the kingdom of God forward. It's not based on performance, it's based on his grace and love. I invite you to come to a place where you walk in his grace in a deeper, more profound way. Lord God, as we come before you, we thank you. Thank you that you loved us. Yet while we were sinners, you sent Jesus Christ to pay the debt that we could not pay for ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for the grace of salvation. 
Thank you, Lord, for the grace that you pour out upon us. Help us to not walk in performance mode, but to walk in your love, your grace, your mercy, your goodness. I invite you into each one of our hearts in a deeper dimension. Continue to transform us and mold us and shape us more into your likeness. And for that, God, we are eternally thankful. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Pastor Appreciation. Thank you, Pastor Thank you very Lane. much. I will say this. I love this church. I love your pastor, and, and I appreciate you inviting me back. And, uh, um, oh, hold on, hold on. My wife is taking a picture. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> now she won't. You, 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 any of you know Billy Sunday? Uh, he, like the, the guy from 100 years ago? When Remember the, the photographs that when you had to stand still and, and, and they would expose it for like 10 seconds? Billy Sunday, he, he used to do this and he would stand and then he would get his pose and, well, I, I guess I can't do it. But he would be just, and they would take Billy Sunday's picture and then that's what they would put and they'd say, how did he do that? It's like an anointed by God. It's like supernatural. Well, no, he, he just had good balance, you know, but. <laughs> all right. I don't know where all that came from. All right. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. <laughs> uh, we truly, truly appreciate you coming. Thank you so much.